Let's go down there. It's August 16th. I'm Frank Curtis, the Wall Street Unplugged Podcast, where I break the headlines and... Uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. So I went to Saratoga this weekend. Met a couple of my close friends who I know for over 40 years. No, I'm not 60, I'm 50. One of them I've known since I'm three. Holy cow. And we all get together every year, go to the races. Used to be Gulfstream, watch Florida Derby, but now the past two years it's been Saratoga. And Saratoga have a lot of history there. So my dad bought a house upstate when I was very young. A summer house, he used to go up there the whole entire summer. Some of you know a little bit about this. Listen to me for 15 years on this podcast. Uh, and it's here, It's near Oneonta. It's a small town in New York. Stanford, New York. Not Connecticut, Stanford, New York. But it's near Oneonta. And he was one of the biggest, biggest, biggest racing fans ever. To the point where our corporate Christmas party for his company, which is called FXC Investors, right? Frank Xavier Curzi Investors. Same name as me, man, like that. Uh, it was at the Meadowlands in an area called the Pegasus, which sat on top of the racetrack and it was beautiful right a beautiful restaurant area where it had all windows and you could just go down and look at the races and stuff uh and he used to give 20 dollars to everyone and invite the families of his employees i'd say we probably had like 20 30 people there and everyone loved it this person hit the race i had the five i had the seven and back and forth eating drink and having fun and what he used to do every year sponsor a race and when you open up, you know, the pamphlet or the book, whatever, uh, you know, it's usually the name of the race on top. He called the FXC Special. So that's what it was labeled like at the top of the program. It was a seventh race, eight race or whatever. So after the race, we got to present the trophy. We used to go all the way downstairs and present the trophy to the jockey and the owner who won, right? So we got to meet Angel Cordero Jr., Julie Crone, and just unbelievable. Right? It was just incredible. Anyway... I've been analyzing horses for close to, let's see, I'm 50 years old, uh, probably since I'm five <laughs> when I started. And by the age of 10, I probably was at 20 different racetracks. So he used to take me every place. That was his big thing. But when we lived near Oneonta, we were about an hour and a half, two hours away from Saratoga. So Saratoga is only open in August. It used to be. Now it's a couple more weeks, I think, into you know, July and August. And it used to, you know, rotate with Aqueduct being open and Belmont being open in New York tracks. So it was only open in August and we used to go up there the whole summer. So my dad used to get tickets and we used to go every single week. Those four weeks, every once a week, we used to go at least once a week. And sometimes after that, we'd go to the harness racing right after it. That's how, <laughs> that's how crazy it was when it came to horse racing. And again, I was just a kid at the time, but just walking around, going back to Saratoga, seeing the paddocks and the Drinking the area that had the spring water there, which is disgusting when you drink it, but <laughs> it's something they had for, for many, many, many years, decades. You know, just walking around outside where like 70% of Saratoga, the reason why it's a great track, is outside. And you could bring coolers, pick the picnic tables every place. You could bring your own chairs. Again, those coolers have beers in them, whatever you want. You bring your own food, which by the way, you better bring your own beers because they're $10 and that's just for a Budweiser. <laughs> so by prices went up a lot. I'll talk about that in a second. You know, quartets with banjos playing when they're dressed up, tons of plaques, uh, little areas where you can read, like, little, you know, the plaques of the legends of racing, where, especially through Saratoga, John Velasquez won the most races there, Jerry Bailey, Dean Wayne Lucas. But it's just a, a fun family atmosphere that's kept up with the times, which is now digital, but still has that culture intact, the historic sites, the art galleries, people dressing up. And it just brought back a lot of cool memories you know, times I spent with my dad and, and, you know, times with my two friends, too, who my father also took to a lot of these tracks with me when I was, you know, 10, 15 years old. I used to take those two, two of my best friends with me. So, uh, yeah, they know my dad well. But a few things I noticed here is it was unbelievably packed. So, like I said, we used to go to Gulfstream the last two years when Saratoga. Last year was just following COVID. It is New York, so the restrictions were, you know, a little more crazy where people were really nervous, really nervous there. So it still had a little bit of COVID restrictions in place when I went last year. It wasn't that crowded. This year, it was absolutely jammed. Even when we go into the town area where they have bars and restaurants, stuff like that, there were lines out the door everywhere. Some lines to get in some of these bars were like 20, 30, 40 deep. So 
that to me was incredible. Not only that, when just through the airport, I noticed going there, I had a flight to Albany and coming back, 30% of the people still wear masks, at least 30% of the people, which is crazy. Hey, many of these people are under 35 years old. I'm not saying not wear masks if you don't have, you know, just underlying conditions, but my, my best friends told me that he was at a basketball game and his dad didn't have a mask on, but his son was playing against his son, which I think is 11 years old, 10 years old, and he had the mask on. And dad was like, hey, you know, this is a team you're playing for. He it was like first game, his first game of the season, right? Everyone's just learning about where they have to go and stuff. He was playing for a different team against uh, my friend's son. He just happened to be sitting there and his dad's like, hey, you know, they say you don't have to wear your mask. You could take it off. He's like, no, dad, I can't wear the mask. There's no way I have to wear the mask. I have to wear the mask. And I'm like, holy shit, the way so many people have been conditioned in certain areas and how crazy it is. For a little kid like that, that really has zero risk, right? Zero risk when it comes to COVID. Uh, you know, maybe 0.0001%, right? And just the way, like it is. But I was just surprised even today how many people were wearing masks when you don't have to wear them on flights. And not just on flights, maybe you're close to somebody or whatever, and I could see they don't understand that that air gets refiltered and it's probably the safest place to be in terms of killing germs, and in, inside the airplane, but even you know, get going there, the cab ride, uh, the terminals, that was surprising. You know, get back to the track, everybody was spending money. I mean, they were buying things, lines everywhere inside the track for food, drinks, super expensive. I told you about the beers, ten dollars, sauce and peppers were like sixteen dollars, six dollars for a pretzel, eight dollars for ice cream in a cup, and everything was fifteen twenty deep, which is good to see. Because that economy, it, it, there's nothing to do there in Saratoga and, other than that track. You don't go there to Saratoga that, and say, hey, you bring your family. And you bring a really to Lake George and other places and stuff like that. But you really don't go to Saratoga. You go there for the track. That's their economy. That's their year, which I think it's extended to six, seven weeks, whatever it is now. It used to be only four weeks or, or the whole month of August, which, believe it or not, is five weeks this month. I know that because we write newsletters every week. <laughs> so I have an extra week off. But, uh, it was unbelievable. It was nice to see just everybody hanging out, laughing, having a good time, beers, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties there. It was, you know, you had the, the crowds ranging from, you know, again, bachelorette, bachelor parties, 20s into 60s, 70s, 80s. Just a nice mix of everyone having fun. Some people dressing up, going to the clubhouse. Also, I did manage to win $3,500. <laughs> I was handicapping well, which, uh, you know, when it comes to horse racing, sometimes have your good days and your bad days. It was definitely a good day. Let, nailed a lot of long shots. I won seven out of 11 races. One of them, I was very lucky since I bet 518, which is my birthday, May 18th, only because my dad used to bet that every single race. So I always bet 518 exacta and triple, right? Box, no matter what. And then I'll do the handicapping for the race and put a little bit of money on some of the other horses. But the eight was about to get into the gate and threw his jockey. And he just started running around the opposite side of the track with no jockey on. They had to catch him. So they scratched him. So at the last second, I'm like, all right, let me throw another number in there. And I just, I don't know why I picked the 11. And bang, right? Hit the exact, hit the triple, 1,400. So that part was lucky. <laughs> but uh, yeah, did good work, good job handicapping. I've been doing it for a very, very long time. It doesn't always work out this way when it comes to horse racing, but it was just on fire. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And my friends, every time I won, were like, he's going to get cold. He's going to get cold. He's going to get cold. And then follow me. They should follow me. You follow the hot guy. That's what you do in racing. When guys are hot and they see things, you follow them. It doesn't happen often. It happened that day for me. I was happy. But it was a good day all around. Just betting, hanging with friends, having some great memories. Uh, you know, hanging with my dad, just bringing that stuff up was really, really cool. So it was just nice to get away, clear my head, because now it's back to work. And again, every place I go, I'm actually going to Palm Beach conference, guys. Uh, you guys had... Gets free tickets. All you have to do is purchase any one of my newsletters for $5,000. I'll give you a free ticket. I'm just kidding. I'm pretty sure we still offer free tickets. You go to our site, CurzioResource.com, speaking at uh, NFT and, and uh, Metaverse Conference. And it's going to be Saturday and Sunday. So I'm leaving there to go to Thursday because there's a couple of events on Thursday. And then Friday, we're going to be setting up more events on Friday. So uh, again, so free. If you want to see me, send me an email or you know we'll get you tickets for free for that event. And that event's going to be really, really, really cool. Just went to Vegas couple of weeks ago, but everywhere I travel, I've been traveling a lot over the past few months. Just airports are busy. They're begging people to take other flights and paying them a fortune to do so. Uh, you just Every place has been packed. Restaurants have been packed. You know, I'm not seeing any slowdowns in terms of the consumer and what they're spending. Maybe a little bit where the lines aren't as long and you could actually you know eat dinner on Thursday, Friday night and maybe get a reservation at 7 o'clock where you weren't getting a reservation probably three, four, five months ago. 
uh, maybe a little bit in that regard, but people are still spending. So, you know, getting back to work now, so far this week, it's been interesting. And notice I'm talking about the economy and spending because there's a lot going on. And people think we're in a recession. We're not in a recession. Markets have come back, right? Stocks come back, but they're going to crash. You know, what's going on with pricing power? We're seeing inflation everywhere. Food price going through the roof. Oil has come down. Like, it's just these mixed results. Let's see what happened just this week. We have Walmart reported solid numbers. Basically, you know, easily beat the estimates. But those estimates were significantly revised lower, which you all know. But they also maintain their guidance, which is key. It means they're not seeing a slowdown going forward. Some positive highlights from large retail. Holy cow, management gets an A. What they've done, especially inventory. Got rid of tons of inventory. They said that months and months and months of inventory. They were loaded up. Target said the same thing. Cole said the same thing. Makes sense because you had these supply chain concerns and you're seeing this massive demand and we're like, okay, let's fix it and do everything we can, over order everything. And then all of a sudden we see a slowdown at the wrong time and they're sitting there going, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Well, we got to sell for lower prices. But Walmart has handled this tremendously, reducing the number of shipping containers by more than half from last quarter, which makes it in line with historical average. Just listen to that line. That line's from, the, from their conference call. So to reduce the number of shipping containers by more than half last quarter, by more than half, that's how much they overordered because of demand. Because they're saying now that's more in line with historical average. Canceled billions of dollars in orders to get inventory levels down a lot quicker, which is smart. But how quick was that? So imagine deserve a lot of credit. You know, many retails, what do they do when it comes to inventory concerns? It makes sense. It makes sense. You're going to try to sell it. You know you have to sell it. You got to get rid of it because now you have back to school stuff coming. The weather's changing, whatever it is. You want to sell at the highest price possible. And, but you have to get rid of it. You have to get it off the shelves, which is almost impossible to do. So it usually keeps those levels higher for a lot longer. And that creates a drag on earnings, at least for a couple of quarters. One month saw one quarter. Of the inventory concerns, quarter before wasn't that great, but that was mostly supply chain concerns. But it took one quarter for one to fix inventory problems, which is the biggest risk to retailers right now, by far. Let's see what happens. I bet you you're not going to see it with every company. Let's see what Target says. Let's see what Cole says. Let's see what all these guys say. But wow, that was really, really quick of how fast they fixed that problem and good for them. Very good for them because it didn't really hurt their results in terms of the revised numbers. And they also said spending was very strong for consumers, able to raise prices a little bit, which is very, very good for margins. Kept those margins higher, which is why they met estimates. And still plans on buying back $11 billion in stock, which is not too much for the size of this company, but it is significant. The stock's up 4% today, closing in $140. It was $118 two months ago with the warnings. It's all-time high all-time high is 160. So we're looking at a stock that's what? 10%, 12% off of that? Which is kind of insane when you think about it. If you look at Walmart, you would think it's down 25, 30%. It's only down 10, 12% from his highs. I'm not telling you to go out and buy it here. I think it's a little expensive at 22 times forward earnings with the rest of the market trading at 17, 18 times earnings. But it's nice to see basically one of the biggest, not the biggest, is a big box retailer, biggest, but biggest retailers in the world Report good results, getting revised lower, saying that they're still seeing consumer demand, got the inventory levels back in check. This is how you get a real update of how this could lead to other things you may buy or other stocks you want to buy in retail. Let's see what Target says. A lot of retailers reporting this week, but you have to listen to these calls. This is great. I'm not telling you to go out and buy Walmart. I think it's a little expensive. It's probably better to buy Target here or other companies here. Let's see. Target might say we still have margin, we still have inventory concerns, and margin shrunk. And they, they, yeah, they remember Target missed estimates and Walmart missed estimates by a mile, and their stocks fell by the most in like 25 years. Then Target came out like two weeks later and lowered their estimates again. That's how quick people change their spending habits. These companies will usually give you an indication, like Target did, even Walmart did, but Target did two weeks later, but they'll give you an indication into the core, like, hey, demand is really, really slowing, and they'll give you, you know, a little warning. Happened so fast last quarter, Walmart calls all these guys, they didn't give us a warning. That's why they fell 25 plus percent. So you need to listen to these conference calls. You're going to see the winners and the losers throughout every industry. Some of them are going to be trading 13 times forward earnings and great, and some of them are going to be trading at 22 times earnings and they're not so great. 
You have to figure that out because not everything. The S&P 500 has jumped tremendously off its lows. We we're very, very bullish. Eight weeks ago, six weeks ago, four weeks ago. I'm not very, very bullish right now, but I still see lots of ideas that have lots of upside potential. Not the whole S&P 500 because we've seen a lot of stocks 25, 30% off their lows. Granted, there's still some of them is down 70% from their highs. But there's still a lot of ideas that are working and you need to pay attention. That's how you find new ideas. Also on the economic front, I want to bring this up. I've been talking about it, right? The biggest theme is inflation. So funny, if you hashtag inflation pre-November, nothing, nobody cared. Now it's top five, top 10. If you're looking at, at you know, stories of mentioning inflation, you're looking at, at Twitter, social media. Again, we get all these statistics of, of, of the trends that are taking place. Inflation's up there a lot. Everybody's talking about inflation now. So the economic front, what do we see? More signs of inflation easing. Sounds familiar for listeners' podcasts. He says, inflation, it's still going through the roof. Fed's going to go crazy. It's easing. We're see, We're going to continue to see these numbers moderate and come off their highs. So this time, it's with housing starts fell 10% month over month. 10%. 10% month over month. While building permits fell 1.3%. It makes sense because those higher rates impact housing the most. See people saying, wait, I'm going to wait. I don't want to pay another $700 because six, seven months later, because mortgage rates went from three to five, five and a half, six percent. They're below six percent now. I don't know where they are. I haven't looked at it. Five and change. I think they fell below five a little bit, but a lot more expensive to buy a house today than it was seven, eight months ago. You're also seeing some supply chains, even the, the home builders saying, even with you know, permits slowing and, and you know, new builds slowing. New York Manufacturing Index, did you see that? So now you're seeing them order a lot less because they're nervous over the next six months. But the New York Fed Manufacturing Index crashed. It was 11.1 in July, which is terrible, but it's a negative 31.3 in August? Holy cow. Forget about if you know like what that means, right? You just know that 11 is pretty far off from negative 31 month over month. <laughs> you know? So that's pretty bad. So these survey members said they expect to see demand slow incredibly and sharply over the next six months. And another sign of the inflation coming down, look at oil, broke through the 90 level, right? Where is it, $89? It was 122 just two months ago. You're down close to 30% on oil. We'll see how interest rates might not impact oil as much, but we are seeing demand get curbed, expenses go higher, people are doing less, they're figuring it out, especially with gasoline prices coming down. And Goldman came out and said, look, we expect oil prices to shoot sharply higher, I think to over 120, and gasoline prices to shoot sharply higher to end the year. Let's see what happens. Again, they're not demand. I don't know if we'll see that demand, right? Because we're starting to really produce a lot more oil finally, which is good in the U.S. Who knows tensions in Russia, Ukraine, if that ends, you're going to see food prices crash. You're going to see oil prices and, not, and gasoline prices come down tremendously, which means Russia right now is in the driver's seat because... A lot of these kind of should be begging them to say, hey, all right, lay off. You got your point across, whatever. But it is amazing how heading into November elections, nobody's talking about the war anymore. Remember that was the number one story? Russia's attacking this, and, and Zelensky needs help, and they're attacking a the nuclear plant. Watch out, holy cow, all this stuff, all this. We're not hearing too much about it, right? All of a sudden, we stop caring. Yeah, we'll give you four or five billion dollars in weapons and not account for it and not know where exactly it's going. That's okay. And then here you go. Just fight your war. But notice how we're not really talking about that. Not too much anymore. However, if we see that end, which I don't think it's a forever war, that's going to be great for food prices, which are, which remain high. Okay. We can't, we can't say anything about that, right? There's no, no denying that. We want to see food prices come down, and they need to come down. From a personal level, guys, if you listen to this, I'm not sugarcoating anything. Prices are down, but they're still incredibly high year over year. But as prices come down as an investor, that is great. It means the Fed's doing its job. And yes, you can have the Fed presidents and even Powell say, we need to see more evidence. 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 They have to say that. They can't say right now that, hey, we're going to slow it September because everyone's going to go out and buy. The market's going to take off and everything's going to get expensive again. So you're looking at the Fed in a great position because it's clear as day. Higher rates are working to slow the economy, especially housing. Yes, rental incomes remain stubbornly high, which is a major component in CPI. Eventually, those will ease as housing comes down. 
that housing demand is slowing while supply, supply chains are easing as we're seeing demand pull back. So when it comes to the Fed, what are they doing? They're finally doing their job, which I mentioned last week. You could destroy them. and know it's, it's great to destroy the Fed. We've done it as well of the shitty job they've done. But they're finally in the right place. I said last week, the Fed is for the first time in over two years ahead of the curve when it comes to inflation. Why? Because they have the ability to continue tightening if inflation does not moderate. So here we see gasoline prices, oil prices, food prices continue to surge. Hey, the Fed's there. And they can tighten. They can raise rates. Also has the ability to slow rate hikes or even stop them if we see the U.S. economy really start falling into recession, which we are likely to see because those job numbers are going to be horrible. The job numbers are going to get very, very horrible. I don't know how quick it's going to be. We might have one month where it's going to be, eh, okay, we've seen it with continuing claims. You're going to see those job numbers. And you could just look around you and look around all these places that were hiring so much. They're not hiring as much anymore. And you're seeing layoffs in the news like crazy, especially from the largest technology companies. You're seeing it, even in financial services industries, throughout the crypto industries. You're seeing layoffs. They're generating less money. Growth is slowing. They're not going to hire people at the same pace, which means you're going to see wage growth probably slow as well, a little bit. That's what you got to worry about next. Got to look at those unemployment numbers. But right now, you're looking at the Fed and what we talked about. They're ahead of the curve. There's no surprises here. And what does that do? It creates certainty. Well, if we have inflation going lower or higher from here, the Fed is pretty much in charge. They can do lots of things right now, which makes sense. Ease, tighten, again, it, it, it's, it was a lot different. When I said the Fed doesn't have to do anything crazy now, whether we get inflation going higher or lower, is of course we have rates at 2.5. They're going to be at least at 3% to end this year. Some people think it's higher. I'll talk about it in a minute. But when the Fed is being forced in November to raise rates from zero to 2.5%, again, in just seven months' time because inflation soared to the highest levels in 40 years and you had no clue and didn't see it coming, that's when we get 11 out of 12 down weeks in a row. That's why we're not seeing this crazy volatility and 3% moves, especially over the past few weeks. And what's happened over the past two, three weeks, the economic data has been showing that inflation is easing. This creates more certainty. I'm not saying inflation's okay and we're good and you're not, you know, you, we still need it to come down. But it's heading in the right direction. It's going to continue to head in the right direction as long as we keep rates high. Or where they are right now. With that said, because as I said, certainty is great for the markets. It's predictable. And when you have uncertainty, that's when we have a crazy market, something we've never seen before. Massive deleveraging, nuttiness, craziness everywhere. That's what you see when you have uncertainty, when the Fed has no clue what they're doing. Now, back in the driver's seat. We have certainty in the markets. That's great. That's why you're seeing stabilization. You're seeing follow through here. We've gone up tremendously. Now, with that said, go watch TV right now. Go watch CNBC, Fox Business. By the way, I was on Fox Business the other day with buddy Charles Payne. But if you watch a lot of these channels and who's getting on, almost every expert, top economist to market pundits, almost every single one of them, and I read all the reports that they put out, believe that the recent surge in stocks is a bear market rally. Almost all of them. I haven't seen anyone say, you have to buy stocks right now. Holy cow. When have you seen? Have you seen that right now? No, you're not seeing that. Pretty interesting. I mean, from technicals, technical investors. Clearly, we're seeing more companies above the 50-day movie average, right? But how many people are coming on and saying, it's a bear market rally. Got to be careful. We haven't hit bottom yet. Don't believe stocks are going to pull back from me as the Fed will still sharply raise rates from here. From here. And I'm hearing four or five more rate hikes. I'm saying in September you should be done. They might be done. They're not going to say that now, obviously. But I still think these numbers, which you know, a couple more out today that I mentioned, oil prices breaking below 90. Wait till you see August numbers. Anyway. Look at it, oil's down probably another 12, 50 cent this month alone, and that's going to count for the, the September, when the September's released, that's going to count for the August number. So look at that data almost across the board. It's going to show that inflation is definitely, without a doubt, easing almost across everything, with the exception of food and a few other things. So everybody believes the Fed's going to sharply, sharply raise rates from here. 
well through tw- this year, 2023, after September, predicted another two 25 basis point rate hikes, and also through March 2023, because they saying, right now they're saying, they need to do this inflation remains stubbornly high. It's not coming down fast enough. That's the consensus. Now, before you jump on this side of the trade, and you watch TV and you go, wow, okay, a lot of my names are up like 20%. You know, maybe I should just take everything out of the market. You know, I don't want it to happen. What happened the other, you know, a couple months ago where it just kept going down and down. Well, the Fed didn't know what they were doing. Nobody knew what the Fed was going to do. And the Fed's the strongest body in the world that can, could force every single country in the world into a deep depression if they wanted to. That makes them the strongest organization in the world if they wanted to. But they have the power to do that. Now, before you go out and sell all your stocks, hear this. In January, we all know in November what happened with the Fed. Powell came out and said, holy shit, I'm an idiot. Made a huge mistake. Inflation, it's not transitory. It's going a lot higher. I thought it was going to be below 2%. It's at 3 3 3.5% now. I it was going below 2%. Maybe it goes to 4%. They had no idea it was going to go 8 9%. <laughs> no idea, obviously, because in January, almost the same. Every sell-side shop. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, economists from these firms go in and go on Google and put January, put three rate hikes, January CNBC, and read that article. Clear as day. And that's not the only article. There's tons of them. But through January, and this is after November when the Fed said it's an about face. We, hey, holy cow, we got to raise rates significantly, shrink our balance sheet. All these sell side shops and their economists from these firms, the same people that are telling you that you. The market's going to crash right now. It's a bear market rally. Interest rates are going to skyrocket from here. These same people, what were they saying? Inflation was transitory. This is in January. We're going to see a soft landing, and the Fed would only raise rates three times for all 2022. That's what they said in January. Go back and look. Three times to 1%. We're 2.5% already going to at least 3% this year. They said 1%. That's how wrong they were. That's why so many people stayed into the market when it got destroyed. Okay, now these are the same people on TV right now that are telling you that people somehow want to listen to, right? Even though they have no track record, even though if I did something like that and lost so much money, again, I have my own company, but you should be fired for a call like that. But no, they're still on TV. These same people telling you like they've been right all along of, hey, the Fed's still going to go nuts, and I can't tell you how many emails I'm getting from people who listen to this podcast, people on my newsletters, and I love it. I love the emails that I get. It creates great conversation. It creates an awesome community. But they're like, Frank, I'm just, I'm just not on the side of you. I don't see it. I don't see it. The Fed has to raise rates. Inflation's all over the place. I just don't see it. Stocks are getting expensive again. They're going to crash. They're going to crash. Maybe they come down. I don't know. I don't crush the ball. What I do know is I hate, I hate being on the side of everyone else, of the consensus. That means you're not being contrarian. For me, I've made my life in this industry for 30 years being contrarian, not doing what everybody else does. That's why you listen to this podcast. There's no one's going to influence me. There's no one's going to say anything. I don't have to listen to a higher power or a boss where we all have to share the same view, whether it's politically or whatever. No. And you know that through COVID. Reporting facts and getting ripped at the facts that you're seeing all true. Not because I'm a genius. It's because I had great people who are doctors at leading organizations emailing me with information. Facts about COVID, which I wasn't reading any place else for some reason. But we know why that was. We now know why that was. This whole bullshit, right? But I do not like ever being with the consensus. Consensus right now is saying this is a bear market rally. You got to sell your stocks. And the Fed's going to continue rising very, very, very aggressively after September. That's cons- consensus. My opinion? No. You're seeing inflation moderate in almost all places. And you're going to continue to see that. People aren't going to suddenly buy houses where interest rates are. They're not going to be like, okay, let's get back to demand things. It's going to continue to ease. And that's what you need. And it's going to come down. If the Fed wants to come down a lot faster, then they may go a 25 basis point hike after September, maybe one more. Stop at 3.5%. If they go anywhere near 4%, it's going to be not just a recession, but a very, very, very big, deep recession. And I hope they don't overshoot. Because you can see it's working. They're asking for evidence. You see evidence everywhere that it's working. We're seeing the moderation working. Remember their stance. They thought this was going to happen a year ago. They thought they were going to see this happen a year ago at interest rates at zero that we're going to see high inflation be transitory. 
because usually inflation takes care of itself. When you have massive inflation, people start buying stuff. You see demand fall, and that's how you control inflation. So it's transitory. They didn't think it was going to go 3, 5, 7, 9%. That's the way they're thinking. That's the way their brains are programmed from doing decades, 20, 30 years of research and looking back. That's usually what happens. Well, it didn't happen as quick as they thought. It's happening now, but you thought it was going to happen at zero interest rates. Now you brought them up to they're going to be three percent in September. You can't tell me they don't think this is going to be transitory now, or we're going to see inflation moderate. We're seeing it. Don't overshoot. That's the worst that could happen. Yes, you could say, well, you could just go ahead and, and lower rates again. It, as you see, it takes a while to filter through the system. So it could be really, really, really hard times for six months. If we go past three and a half to four percent of what these guys are predicting, you should be selling stocks if you think that. You should. Don't listen to me. But based on everything I've said before November, how the Fed has to reverse their stance, adjusting our portfolios, saying inflation is wildly out of control, which anyone that pays their bills knows. You didn't listen, didn't even listen to this podcast to know that. Now you're looking at the markets going, okay, what do I want to do right now? It's all about today and into the future. Today, you don't have to get super aggressive. We saw a nice move in so many names. But going forward from here, there's a lot of stocks I like. A lot of stocks I like. And you see an upside in many, many names. Again, I'm not looking, I'm telling you to buy the Walmarts, which are down 12% from their all-time highs here, which I think it should be down a little bit more. I mean, yeah, they have estimates, they, they revise their estimates sharply, sharply lower. And this is a different company three months ago, four months ago, five months ago. I think it was five months ago when it hit its highs. It's much stronger ground than it is now. There's still many names down 30% plus from their highs where insiders are buying, companies are buying back shares. They have pricing power, been unfairly punished through the massive, massive, massive deleveraging caused by the quick rise in interest rates which nobody had, right? Nobody predicted it'd be that fast that we go to 2.5% in six months because of the Fed was on the wrong side of the trade, which forced, it caused so many fund managers to force selling, right? They were forced to sell. That's what happens. So you're forced to sell even your good names because you're so leveraged. And this is evident. Look at, if you look at some of the great names in crypto, small caps, biotech, some of these, they fell to levels that were insane. They're up 30, 40% from their highs right now. Even biotech, start looking at biotech names. We trained 30% below the net cash, the balance sheet, some names, good names. But that's where I'm finding the best ideas. You're seeing them come up in my newsletters. I just think it's a stock picker's market right now. Well, maybe I don't go into Walmart. We'll see what Target says. We'll see what Cole said. But there's going to be retailers that are down 30%, 40% and not down just 12% like Walmart that are saying, hey, we solved our inventory concerns. They're going to say the same thing. We have pricing power. We're still seeing demand from the consumer. But they're down 30% from their highs. And they're probably trading at 17, 18 times forward earnings. Well, Walmart's trading today at 22 times forward earnings down 12% from its highs. Because people feel a little more comfortable buying a bigger name that pays a little bit of a dividend. That's where I'm looking right now. That's where the opportunity is. And just be careful who you listen to. Because a lot of these guys are saying rates are going, they're going to skyrocket from here. And this is a bear market rally. And the same guys that said inflation is transitory. You have nothing to worry about in January. And we're only going to see a couple of rate hikes. Go back and look yourselves. Pretty crazy. People forget. And it's only been, what, seven, eight months. So guys, that's it for me. Good news. The increase is back. From his ninth vacation this year, which is awesome. So we meet tomorrow to break down the markets. If any questions, comments, I'm here for you. If you're email at research.com. That's frank at research.com. Really appreciate all the support. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care.